Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Tanisha Shades Fain and I'm your host for Mid-American Gardener. Thanks so much for being here. We've got a lot to talk about this evening and we've got our panelists here to share their expertise with you and they brought some great show and tell. So before we get into that, let's have them go around and introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their specialty. So Kent, we'll start with you. Thanks, Tanisha. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Kent Miles and I am a cut flower grower uh, in Illinois Willows is the company name and we're located in uh, West uh, Champaign County. Okay. And we can take questions on cut flowers, uh, woody ornamentals. Great. So. Okay. Don? I'm Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from the University of Illinois. And while I was at the university, I taught introductory plant pathology, diseases of field crops, and diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses. And I did research on corn diseases with emphasis on genetic resistance. When I retired, I got bored, so I became a master gardener, which has been a lot of fun for me. Okay, and last but not least. Yeah, I'm Jim Appleby. I'm an entomologist at the University of Illinois and the Illinois Natural History Survey, and so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and um, flowers. Okay, so we've got you covered tonight. Also, we are live and we would love to take your phone calls. It's been great the past couple of weeks getting lots of calls in and questions. So 333-3495 is the number to give us a call and we're going to do a round of show and tells and we'll hopefully jump to the phone line um, after that. So Kent, what did you bring us? Okay, uh, today I brought in a, this is a bunch of the European cranberry uh, viburnum mm -hmm. and right now it's at the uh, lime green stage, the berries. In May, we had the flowers, and now we're getting the berry production. Uh, so we sell this as a cut branch in the floral trade. It also, um, as the season progresses, they'll turn um, a yellow to a red. And um, it's right now we're offering it as a green item. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very long lasting as a cut flower or cut branch in the home. And just add some texture and mm -hmm. color to yeah. the arrangement. And, and berry, berry branches are, have still uh, been popular. They started getting really popular in the uh, uh, floral trade about oh, eight to ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And they're still thought, sought after as far now, as Now, are these designs. the ones that you bring in? And it may be completely different, but the ones you bring in around the holiday season? No. Uh, okay. That's the Ilex, the gotcha. winter berry. Okay. Uh, this one kind of has a little bit of a maple leaf mm -hmm. uh, foliage. Uh, it has a white blossom, which is where the, uh, in May, this would be a, a white flower. And then the berries are formed uh, from the flower. Very pretty. Very so, pretty. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. All right, Don, we are moving to you for your show and tell item. Yes, my show and tell items are sycamore anthracnose. Sycamore anthracnose, next slide, is a disease that I think if you have a sycamore tree anywhere near, you've seen it. Uh, Poor leaf out this spring, uh, not very well developed leaves or dead leaves and twigs next. Now the trees are starting to recover, but they don't look good because you get a whole bunch of little shoots at, at the end of the branches. Next. And here we can see uh, in the foliage, uh, what happens is this particular disease will attack trees. It requires a temperature of 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. 24 hour average, and wet weather. And gosh, what do we have this spring? Yeah, pretty much something. So what <laughs> happened was there was a lot of sycamore anthracnose. Um, next. You also see some symptoms on leaves. Usually what will happen, the bad part is it kills the buds before they come out, rots them, and it also then will get into twigs and cause cankers. Next. Here it is growing up the veins of the leaf. Now, I took this leaf right here, next, and here's a twig, next. Took this leaf, and there's some black dots under it, and then next, this is what you see with a dissecting scope. These are piles of spores on the underside of the leaf, and those spores were formed during wet conditions. And those spores then are kind of glued together uh, with a water-soluble material, so they, they can't be spread unless there's water. Then what happens, the spore has to lay in water for a period of time, and then it can germinate. So it needs water to spread the spores, it needs water for the spores to germinate. So these are, what kind of a condition now? 
Uh. Question, what is it? Wet? Okay, wet. <laughs> All right. I didn't Next know there slide. was going to be a test. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Next slide. This is a cross section through an acervulus. It's uh, the thing that produces the spores. It kind of looks like a cushion, and the spores were born on top. Next. Now, this is a sycamore on campus near the uh, library. And one thing that we did was it got so it was in bad shape. It had been diseased for several years. Next slide. We did a tree injection with Arbitec. And basically what happens, we do the injection in August. Because what we're trying to do is kill off the fungus that's in the twigs. It'll be next year's inoculum. And a good tree injection usually will last for several years for control. Trees are also injected with Arbitec for control or prevention of Dutch elm disease. And what happens, I was amazed. We did this thing. It sucked up 300 gallons of liquid in a matter of minutes because you got these big xylem vessels, you got uh, you got uh, transpiration pull, and it just goes right in. Next one. Here you can see the little uh, things that are tapped, the drill hole, and tap them into the tree. Next. And here I have in my hand, this is one of the, the injection devices that was developed by Merck Chemical. And you can see what happens, it's got tubing go on either end here, but then you can take it and tap it in its hole with a little mallet, which really makes it fit in there nicely. So uh, there's still some cities that will do this on trees. Wow. I also have. That's quite a process. <laughs> now there's anthracnose diseases on all kinds of plants, mm -hmm. and they're caused by different fungi, different genus of species. This is the one on maple. Now, the one on maple doesn't do anywhere near the damage that you get on sycamore trees because of the leaf blight. And sometimes, I always figured this was a blessing because what will happen is you lose some leaves in the spring, and if you're trying to grow grass under a sugar maple, this lets a little bit of light in. And usually there's no reason to control this. There's one that occurred on ash, and there was no reason to try to control it. And there's also anthracnose diseases on corn and soybeans and all kinds of plants. So the tree that was treated on campus, what's, what's the prognosis? Well, it, it was better for a couple of years. Now it's got it again because I don't know that they're treating again. Oh, so it's something that they would have to maintain? You'd have to go in every couple of years and gotcha, treat. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, that was interesting. Okay, thank you. All right, we're to you, Jim. What did you bring? Well, a lot of people are having trouble with an uh, insect called the four-line plant bug. And I'd like to show you some of the injury that this insect causes. It, uh, this is a, some mint. You can see the damage to the uh, foliage of mint. So it gets the, uh, this insect, when it feeds, <coughs> it's a true bug, and so it inserts its mouth part into the leaf, and then that area that uh, is pierced then will die. You can see these little patches. Also, it has a wide host range, so you can find it on many different plants. Even on some trees like shumac, I've seen damaged by the four-line plant bug on, on shumac. Here we see uh, damage on Shasta daisy. Mm -hmm. And you can see all these spots on the Shasta daisy. And uh, it, it's a very common insect on Shasta daisy. And actually, I, I killed some of them and uh, stuck them on here with some paste. And if we get a close-up <laughs> of the... Uh, oh, I can see it. Yeah, I can see them on there. You can see these down at the bottom. Actually, if you get real close, you could see that they have four line, four black lines, and that's why it's called the four line plant bug. Yeah, right there, four line plant bug. So uh, let me just explain the life history of this insect. They overwinter in the egg stage within a plant like this, and then the eggs hatch in spring. Generally, they hatch in uh, early May, and the little nymphs are red and black. And if you have a plant that's infested with this insect, you'd see them running around. They're, they're rather tiny, but they're, they're very, very active. So you'd see them uh, running around on the plant, and then they insert their mouth parts in the leaf, and then wherever they insert their mouth parts, that area will die. So if you have uh, many of them, then you can have uh, you know a, a lot of damage. They're particularly bad on chrysanthemum. I had some chrysanthemums that was badly mm. damaged by this insect. And then they change to the adult stage, generally sometime in, in late May. 
and they're in the adult stage for about a month during the month of June. And now they're dying off, so uh, that you really won't see much damage more with, with this insect. If you want to control this insect next year, one thing you could do is just take uh, all the branches that were, in, uh, were where you found insects, like on the Shasta daisy. I would cut all that information, the all the branches on the Shasta daisy, and then throw those branches in your compost heap or burn them. That would destroy the overwintering eggs. And then the other method you could do, when you see the little nymphs, you could spray with a soap spray. That would be one spray. Or you could dust with seven. That would control them. Mm -hmm. But if unless you uh, get after them early, uh, then you can get quite a bit of damage. And uh, they don't kill the plant, but they certainly reduce the... Um, you know the buds, the buds that would develop, mm -hmm. the flower buds that develop. So, okay, very common insect. Thank you. All great information. Uh, we've got some calls lined up, thankfully. So we're gonna uh, take a break from those and take some calls. So Kathy and Champagne is on the line, and it appears her rows of Sharon's are dying. Kathy, are you there? Hi. Go ahead with your question. It's the red buds, but I've had a huge growth of poison ivy. So. Um, I d I'm not quite sure what to do with, you know, with this. Do I rip out the Rose of Sharon's, cut them all down, and the red buds, and then, you know, is there something going on with that? And, you know. And the poison, poison ivy. Okay. So she's got a three-part question. So who wants to tackle the, the, the roses? Rose of Sharon, sorry. Rose of Sharon is dying. Yes. Okay. Take a look down on the base of the stem later on. There's a fusarium canker, and it'll form a golden brown little pustules on the base of the plant and that is responsible a lot of times for Rosa Sharon dying. It's a fairly common disease. Red buds? Red buds, uh, you've got a little bit of everything on get red buds but uh, verticillium wilt. How long has the red bud been in place? About 10 years. Oh really? Now it's just now showing damage? They, they've died way back. Yeah. Okay, a lot of times you buy red buds and they come in, they've already got verticillium wilt. Take a knife and cut into the stem and see if you get some greenish or brownish streaks. If you do, it's, it's uh, verticillium wilt, it's going to die. Okay. The patient's dead. Uh, the patient's dead. And lastly, we were talking about this actually just before the show because we're all having a little battle with poison ivy on our own. So any suggestions there? Spray Roundup on the leaves. Okay, quick and to the point. There's little right. plants growing up. They're poison ivy. Oh, I think we, I think she's gone. Yeah. But okay, get some roundup. <laughs> Next, we're going to, I believe, Carmen Urbana with a question about hostas. Carmen, are you there? Hello, are you there? Okay, we're going to skip that one then and let's try line three. We've got Dusty from Bloomington with a question about elm trees. Dusty, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, go ahead. Uh I have uh, volunteer elm trees that are growing. Uh, some of them are getting to a good size, 15, 20 feet tall. Is there any possibility that they will be immune to the Dutch elm disease, or should I just might as well go ahead and chop them down? <laughs> no, it's wishful thinking. I've got a bunch of them in the woods, and they keep coming up, and, and they'll last for a while. But basically what will happen, eventually they'll get to a point where they get in good growing conditions. Uh, the xylem vessel gets big enough, the fungus spreads throughout the plant, and they're dead. So I wish. Uh, womp womp. Okay. We're going to Bruce and Decatur uh, with another question about a tree that died. Bruce, are you there? Yeah. Hi, go ahead. I bought a tree. This has been about 15 years ago, and it was called a purple leaf forest pansy. And it had like heart shaped leaves and they're like purple on top and then they're like a light green underneath and um the tree um of course i'd never heard of it before so i didn't know if maybe this tree was maybe shipped to the nursery it was like in the wrong zone or something but <laughs> you know we had a bad winter this year but i, I didn't prune the year or i haven't pruned it for the last couple of years but i've had it for like you know for a while and the spring when the leaves started to come on, they only got this about the size of a 50 cent piece, which is, you know, the leaves are as big as your hand. And it just, the leaves turned golden brown and the tree just died. And I couldn't imagine, you know, 
what what would have caused that, you know, because the bark and everything else looked healthy, you know, it looks it didn't look like it, it was stressed or anything. Okay, so an established tree just drops dead. Well, it could be out of its planting range. Yeah. I don't know exactly what kind of, you know, I've never heard of that tree. I before. never heard of that either. You might want to look that tree up and see the planting zone it's supposed to be in because I think it's out of its zone. But for it to live so long, is that uncommon? To be out of its zone and to make it? You get a lot of stuff that will go on for a long time, and then what will happen is you get a bad winter, freeze thaw, freeze thaw, mm -hmm. and then they die. And that kicked the bucket. Okay. We're going to Barbara in Pontiac with a question about yellow squash. Barbara, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, go ahead. Um, I have yellow squash plants and zucchini squash plants. They're just loaded with foliage, loaded with blossoms. But when the fruit gets about an inch and a half, two inches long, um, the end where the blossom was, after it falls off, it turns the end of that turns brown, and the little fruit dies. What do you think? Go ahead, Don. I think it's the disease. Yeah. I think it's... Are these the male flowers, the female flowers, or what? Do you know? I don't know. How, I don't know the difference between a male and a female flower. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is to do that. Usually you're going to have a certain number of uh, flowers that abort, the fruit abort, but I don't. But with this high moisture content, we get a lot of fungus growing on the uh, yeah. ends of those things. So it's probably a disease that the uh, plant's getting that causes that. Don't know for sure. And you probably, if, do you see any bugs feeding on The squash bug will feed on it and... They'll actually introduce some bacteria and fungi when they feed on it. But if you don't see that, then it's got to be a, a disease. Disease. Okay. Okay. Not sure. Okay. We're going to go to Helen in Atlanta with a question about a mystery vine. Helen, are you there? Yes. Hi, go ahead. Okay. In my flower beds, it's this viney stuff that grows up out of the ground and it wraps around and around and around whatever it can get close to. And when you pull it, you know, at the ground, then it just snaps off the ground, but you're not killing it. What is it and how do I get rid of it? What color is the flower? I don't, it doesn't flower. It, it just vines. I bet it'll flower sooner or later. Well, yeah, but I don't let it grow that long. <laughs> <laughs> it, it may be field bind weed. That third thing will, it's awful. Yeah. It, it's, it's a relative of morning glory. Oh, that's about all you the only to thing say. you're going to be able to do to get rid of it is to kind of tease it out into a place where you can spray it with Roundup, coax it out onto a board or something like that. You can squirt the foliage. And some of those plants will have underground systems that are down 30 feet. And you, just, and you never want to let it go to seed. No, let, never let it flower and go to seed. Never, ever, ever. You're going to have it forever. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to Carm and Urbana. Carm, are you there? Every we time have. Yay, we got her. Hi, go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, we, we have a lot of hostas and in our backyard because we have mostly shade. And I've noticed uh, probably started two weeks ago or three weeks ago, some of the different types of hostas have holes in the leaves um, that just <laughs> appear. And when I looked it up on the Internet, it said probably snails or slugs uh, that come out at night and it, they hide during the day under the mulch. Um, what can I put... Um, do I put something on the hostas, or do I treat the mulch, or what can I do because whatever they are are destroying some of the hostas. They don't bother some hybrids of the hostas, but some they really eat up. Well, one method I've heard is fairly effective is place a board, an old board, underneath that area, and then sometimes the uh, slugs will hide in that area and then you can destroy them in the morning right. just lift that little board up um, i use crushed eggshells i don't know if that's popular but mm -hmm. i use it and it and, works for and me there are some baits that you can use mm -hmm. slug baits so you know i think are... years ago i even used like a little saucer and pour some beer in it yeah they get the and, beer and drown yeah so yeah. that's oh. that is a one method. alternative okay. the trouble worked. is with that can i've had Animals like yeah. uh, raccoons drink the beer. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> has some drunk 
raccoon. Foiled again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. We're going to Joe in Urbana with a question about ash tree treatment. Joe, go ahead. Yes. I've got a question pertaining to an ash tree. I've got probably one of the biggest ash trees in Champaign-Urbana. And I've been treating it with this bear product that you can buy. Uh, and I've been treating it for probably the last, oh, three, four years. And it, 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 it is working somewhat, but I was just wondering if there's anything else in, on the market that I could use to, uh, to treat it with if they've came out with anything new. There is a material called triage, T-R-E-E-A-G-E. -E -E. So it's, it's pronounced triage. That has to be applied by a commercial grower, but that's by far the most effective uh, method of treating. And that's good for about at least two years, sometimes three years. You have to get a commercial applicator to put this on. It's called triage. All right, on to Lori and DeLance with a question about service berries. Lori, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, right, go ahead. Hi. I have a service berry tree, and it has shoots coming up, which I would like to cut. If I put on stump and vine killer, will that kill the tree as well, or will it just kill <laughs> the others? Who yeah, it might. <laughs> a good maybe, or... Are you leaning towards yes, no? No, no. Okay. I never try that with a herbicide on that. No, I, I don't think I'd use a herbicide on it. You're just going to get in there and have to cut it. Yeah. And it's not that much work just to take a cutter here and there. You know. Okay. All right. Looks like we have, um, do we have a call in line too? No, no. Okay. We're going to go back around then. Kent, I've got a question for you from Mona. She hmm. says she has three Annabelle hydrangeas um, here in Naperville or there in Naperville, I guess. They're showing signs of disease and some, or perhaps insect infestation. The leaves have black spots and some leaves are completely black and curled. Uh, what are your thoughts on what she may be seeing? Okay. It's going to be probably more of a fungal issue than an insect issue. Okay. And generally, um, you can treat your hydrangeas a couple different ways. So I'll list a couple different ways in which you can do it. Um, you want to go ahead and kind of, it's a combination of the dampness that we've had this mm -hmm. spring and the humidity. So that's causing a fungal issue on the leaves. So I would go ahead and trim some of the stems out to get a little more air circulation and trim it all the way down to the to the base of the plant. Um, and then applying uh, some fresh compost, about two inches layer, mm -hmm. will suffocate or smother the fungal spores that are in your mulch already. And then uh, just kind of clean up any of the, take off the leaves that have the, the black spot or that are curling up. Um, and then also, as far as um, maintaining or rectifying the issue. Uh, go ahead and take a little bit of uh, like a tablespoon of neem oil into like a little spray bottle, mm -hmm. fill it up with water, uh, thoroughly mix it, and then just go ahead and s spray the whole plant down. Got it. And you want to do that probably about once a week, to seven to ten days. Okay. Um, so that's the basic okay. as far as that. Great. Thank you very much. We've got one more call we're going to try to get in. Betty and Clinton with a question about orange bush. Betty, are you there? Yes, I am. Go for it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, a mock orange uh, bush, and it's quite tall, and uh, it seems to have cankers on some of the stems, and I was wondering if, uh, and some of the older stems mostly, and I was wondering if those should all be removed and just try to encourage younger growth or I'm getting a universal nod from everyone. Yes, everybody's going to shake their head yes. <laughs> yep. Any other follow-up advice? No. That's it? Just okay. Just prune it out. Just prune it out. Okay. Well, we are out of time. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Also want to make sure we let you know next week, since it's the 4th of July, we won't be here. We'll all be uh, celebrating somewhere, right? Celebrating the 4th somewhere. Oh, so yeah, 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 uh, yeah. find us on our socials. Keep up with all things MAG and feel free to email us your questions to yourgarden at gmail.com. We'll do our absolute best to get those answered. And I also want to say uh, when we do come back, 
you're going to see a brand new set. So that week that we have off, uh, we're going to be improving the place and hopefully you'll come back and it'll, it'll be brand shining new. Um, any other tips for folks who are having trouble with this wet growing season? And you talked about mulch and mm -hmm. that kind of thing, but is there anything else just really quickly that we can maybe tell folks who are all sort of dealing with this same thing? Just Better than a drought. <laughs> Okay, there you have it, folks. Yep. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. Good night. Oh, yeah, a lot better than a drought. <laughs>